Hey, good morning. So I'm about to become the bet noir of this conference. And I'm going to become that because I'm about to say that, data, that big data doesn't really exist. So how do you know that big data doesn't really exist? It is a long truth in technology that anything which appears in the press in capital letters and surrounded by quotes isn't real. <laughs> now, I work for a company that uses big data to help financial institutions decide to whom to lend money. Clearly, I believe in big data, or <laughs> I believe in, in something, I guess. But I don't believe in what you see in the press, or what you see commonly from consultants walking into your office. And for all of you who are consultants, I'm going to abuse you through this whole talk. <laughs> Sorry. So for example, in underwriting for many years, roughly every two, three years, someone will show up and say, hey, I have a new piece of math. And this math will solve all of your problems. Anyone who says that to you, you should stand up, smile politely at, and kick out of your office. Because they don't know what they're talking about, there is no math solution to anything. Math isn't the answer. It's not even the question. Math is a part of the solution. Pieces of math have different biases, different things they do well, different things they do badly, just like employees. Hiring one new employee won't transform your company, right? Hiring one new piece of math also won't transform your company. I really love this picture. Do you think he's going to land that jump, or is he fallen? Come on, y'all. This is going to really suck if you don't play along. <laughs> I think he's fallen, for sure. We got land, we got fallen, anyway, I'm done. So even if there were a piece of math, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work because math doesn't work. Y'all all remember your stats one-on-one -on -one course. I'm sure they talked about the normal distribution. It's that beautiful bell curve. There's a mean, you know, and that's kind of right in the middle, hence the name. It's got you know, one standard deviation, plus or minus, two-thirds of all observations fall on that. Like, it's just beautiful, right? It's very elegant. It, it was easy to do math around. Almost all the math that you know or have read or have seen referenced depends on that underlying distribution depends on the data you're analyzing being normal. Sounds great. Almost nothing in the real world is, in fact, normal. For example, how many folks have seen or computed a statistic about the average number of visitors to your website? Probably most of you. The problem is that website visitors aren't normally distributed. It's, it's a form of a power law. Power laws don't actually have means. So when you go compute that mean and do something based on it, you're operating on math, which is just wrong. It may not matter, but you're using false precision. I could give you dozens of other examples of things you think are normally distributed that actually aren't, including natural disasters. Um, lots of modeling was done for insurance and reinsurance companies to try and figure out what the risk of a particular natural disaster was. And they always used normal distributions. And it turns out that's false. Hurricane Sandy, anyone? Height is also not normally distributed. OK, this is an audience participation part. I know there's lots of engineers in the room. Therefore, you're all introverts. I'm telling you all this to warm you up. How do you tell the difference between an introverted and an extroverted engineer? The introverted en extrovert engineer looks at your shoes instead of his own. OK. Wow, I, 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 you guys clapped. I don't want to do that. OK, so just for fun, I went around my office and I uh, measured the heights of 10 women and 10 men. Are men or women taller? Men, right? For those of you who don't know the answer, you're at the wrong conference. Uh, fine. It was incredibly statistically significant that men were taller than women. Then I said, OK, let's do something fun. Let's add Dylan Postal to the data. Dylan Postal, for those of you who don't keep up with your professional wrestling, I kid you not, is a four and a half foot tall professional wrestler. And he's good. So I add him to the data set. That's what's called an outlier. Now the data is not even remotely normally distributed. What happened? According to the simple math, men and women are now the same height. And then if you add Christina Follows, who is a roughly seven and a half foot tall woman, you got an even better outcome. Now women are taller than men. 
The math that you think you know isn't right, and you have to be aware of that. And being aware of that requires more than just math skills. I don't like the phrase data scientist very much. It's either redundant or incorrect. Science is inherently about data, or so Thomas Kuhn argued, in which case data scientist is redundant. However, data is not entirely about science. Therefore, the term is underspecified, either redundant or underspecified. I like data artists better because fundamentally, the hard part actually isn't the math. The hard part is finding a way to talk about that math, and the hard part isn't actually gathering the data. The hard part is talking about the data. The most famous data artist of our time, Nate Silver, actually didn't use that much data and didn't use that hard math. What he did really well was talk about the math really, really well. If you wandered around my modeling team, you would see a few mathematicians, a few experimental or mathematical psychologists, a couple physicists, and a few biologists. What you'll see is people with random kinds of math, but all of whom focus on the ability to talk about the data, not just the math. Data artists are the future. Data artists are the only way to turn big data from a quotated, that's not a word, is it quotated? No, that's not a word. What's the word? Quoted, I guess? I, I'm making words up on stage. From a caps and quoted phrase into something which is actually long-term useful. In the 1890s, the New York Times talked about the telephone in capital letters and with quotes. I don't think any of us would argue today that the telephone was a fad. <laughs> and people laughed at that? That's not even funny. <laughs> You didn't laugh at my jokes, you laughed at that, whatever. What we need to do is build people who are able to understand the math. You can learn that in classes, although there's some hard stuff. Who are also pragmatic enough to take a look at the data and say, hey, you know what, outliers matter here, or this data is not normally distributed, so I can't use those techniques, or you know, what's the key influence and key question here? But also people who have the skills to talk about, to present, to help people understand the actual correct math and pragmatism. We need people who can communicate. So throughout this conference and in lots of other places, you'll hear people talk about really interesting and important pieces of technology. Uh, in our shop, we use R to do our math. Well, lots of people can learn R. In fact, the world's full of R. The world's full of people who can speak R. What the world needs is not more R, what the world needs is more artists. Thank you very, very much.